Good evening, my name is Thomas Caldwell. I'm the programmer at the Melbourne International Film Festival. I would like to begin by acknowledging that we're gathered on the traditional land of the Kulin Nation, and I pay my respects to elders past and present. Welcome to Australian Cities on Film. This is a MIF Talks and Melbourne Conversations event that MIF have done in partnership with the City of Melbourne. This year, the MIF Talks program is presented by the University of Melbourne, Faculty of Fine Arts and Music. For information on other MIF events, please go to mif.com.au forward slash talks. That includes a conversation with Bruce Beresford on Sunday, and there are still tickets left for that. Our moderator tonight is Esther Anatolitis, a writer and facilitator with an abiding interest in creative city making and the role of the artist in urban and regional development. It brings me great pleasure to now hand over to her. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, hello, everyone. What a happy and dense and tight and comfortable group of people on this wonderful cold night. Good on you for coming along and joining us. This place, this land uh, where we're gathered here tonight is the traditional lands, the Bunwarang and the Woiwurrung, or the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations. Always was, always will be. And places here and not too far from here, particularly around the Treasury Gardens, around uh, the Yarra or the, 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 the Birirang, um, these places have been places for conversation, for mourning, for celebration, the exchange of stories for longer than we can possibly imagine. And in coming together to exchange stories and ideas, we honour theirs and pay respects to their elders. Uh, past and present and emerging. Let's talk about cities on film and, um, and suburbs and landscapes and, and, and outer suburbs on film. What makes a city? How many cities do we know only from cinema? And how many of those cities are not Australian? Uh, how many of them are American, European or Asian? Which suburbs do we know intimately from cinema? and which, if any, cities, and what about their landscapes? How often are they the star? We see more and more Hollywood productions made here, and they tend to depict cities in this kind of, you know, generic, uh, global, often American form. How does this erase what's culturally distinct about our cities, their architecture, and more importantly, their people? And in thinking about how our suburbs change over time, where do we draw the line between urban, inner city, outer urban, suburban? How does the Australian landscape contrast with the uniqueness of our cities in the eyes of filmmakers? We have got a great discussion here this evening with these three. Um, we are going to hear from someone who makes films, someone who critiques films, uh, and someone who painstakingly finds the best locations for those films. Um, we're going to chat for just under an hour, and then there'll be time for you to ask some questions as well. So keep thinking of your questions as we go, and we will have some time at the end. So please welcome Location Scout Pia Emery, actor, writer, director Paul Island, and critic Leslie Chow. We've been having such great chats, I have to say, just getting to know these guys so far. There is so much to unpack in this topic, but let's start with Pia. Let's start with looking at the city. And um, Pia was pointing out that ultimately, you know, the job, one of the great challenges of the location scout is to show off the city. But then also there's that challenge of finding a place that has got character, a lot of character, but has maybe a bit of a generic city look as well. How on earth do you balance that? How do you find what you need? <coughs> right. So um, <laughs> I come on board once the vision has been set by the producers, writers, directors. Once the budget has been set and the money is in the bank, that's when I am then employed. That's a good time, I think, to start on a job. On a job. My... My particular creativity as a location manager scout is lateral and logistical thinking. How can I make the dreams of the writers come true? Sometimes they may say, I need it set in Dallas. I may say, I need it set in, in Melbourne. I may seem... It, it always varies. And Melbourne in particular offers a variety of looks because... 
uh, Melbourne, as opposed to any other major city, was planned. Sydney was based on a, on a sheep's trail. Melbourne was planned. We have a grid system. It gets people around. The best way to think about Melbourne is like a seashell. So the very centre, which is about 1880s, when Melbourne was considered the richest country in the world, we have a huge amount of um, 1880 buildings that can double for London, America, Boston, uh, Paris, Prague, uh, and that is Melbourne, North Melbourne, East Melbourne, South Melbourne, that sort of area. And then, like any other shell, the further out you get is where you're going to go for look. So if I want 70s look, I'm going to go Ivanhoe. If I want Art Deco, I'm going to go uh, Williamstown, I'm going to go St Kilda. So uh, as far as asking me where you go, it all depends on the vision of the director and the producer and the designer in front of me asking me, what have you got? So you're kind of looking for, they've got the vision and there's a look that they want and then you're looking for these quite unique places but that, that are sort of generically that look. Sometimes I'm asked for generic and mm. sometimes I'm asked for, for Melbourneian. So, so a little thing, if you're asking generic, well, deciduous trees are going to mm. play a part into it. Power poles, which were brought in in, in the mid-80s is when we had... Um, uh, metal power poles. Before that, you had uh, wooden power poles, which means wooden power poles allow for different countries. And say, if you're wanting to shoot something, period 1970s, has to be a wooden power pole. It has to be that low lying uh, sort of uh <coughs> different wires. It has to be that, that grass that's sprouting from a, a curb that has no footpath. So it, it really does, generic is, is, can be, yeah, anything. And yet at the same time, the, the same location, as you were saying um, in a previous chat, can be represented quite differently by a different director, that you, you can often be offering the same location, but it will mean something and become something quite different. Correct. So, for example, the Newport Rail Yards, which is in... Newport, I have doubled as Boston, Melbourne, uh, Prague, uh, New York, uh, England, uh, and this is in the same hectare space. So it, it really just depends on, as locations, my job is to create the bones for the production to the, then <coughs> build their dream on. Let's go from those bones to the characters, Paul. Um, something that Paul has focused on uh, as a filmmaker is the suburbs as characters uh, and particular suburbs um, such as Footscray. What, what drew you there in the first place? Um, well, <coughs> we just want... We wanted, that, we wanted the feel for the film. That was porno. We set, we set porno um, there in Footscray. It was Damon and I's first film. And... But the, the suburb just really suited the sort of aesthetic of the, the piece we were trying to make, the people, the surroundings, the multicultural back um, sort of melting pot that um, Footscray was at the time. And, um, so, and so we then set out to actually, we used a lot of the people that w lived there and worked there and everything and we created, so we made Footscray itself another character within the film and we, we set out deliberately to do that at the beginning so that people got to know the surrounding area and got to know, it, and it, which helped enhance our, our characters, our actors' lives, and so it really sort of like drew on them and who they were, and it sort of enhanced that. So it was a, it was a sort of like thought out decision to go there for first of all, you know? And what did it mean to, to draw on that kind of enhancement? What, what in particular was it, I guess, around, um, uh, you know, suburbs change while you're working there, uh, and uh, and then while you work there, you change the place as well. Well, you know, it, we, we want to make a multicultural piece about um, Melbourne and how how it's becoming more of a melting pot for different cultures and stuff like that. And uh, we felt Footscray really sort of gave us that and did that. It's got Little Africa. It's got all these different. So it, it was because it was quite a poor area then, but now it's, it became one of those areas that everyone is moving into, and because you, you can earn money and they're growing and it's growing and growing, it's very close to the city. But now, now in, in the last, 
I think we made Tono there in 2015. It's a very, very different place. You know, there's a lot of people have moved in and these, the prices of houses have went up and uh, the other people that live there could afford to live there have had to move out. It is funny the way that we think Social about... Social economics of yeah. life, really. And what was kind of inner city and what was suburban. Um, and um, uh, that, that notion we were discussing earlier, again, around um, the way that certain structures, the scale of them, um, the way that um, uh, big housing commission towers have become iconic of certain places and suburbs, but also their own microcosms and their own cities. Mm. Are you talking about my next film? <laughs> I am. <laughs> yeah, um, <clears throat> that's measure for measure. And when we were writing the script, we we made the commission flats in, um, well, we just made generic commission flats, but we, had, we ended up using the ones in Paran. And, and our idea behind that was to make the commission flats another character within the film, as, as we tried to achieve with um, Footscray. And we wanted to, because the commission flats, they're, it's a beautiful aesthetic, they're amazing. And everyone we spoke to, um, location people, always, you, you'll never get them. You can't film in the commission flats, you can't get them. And we got, so Dame and I sort of hatched a plan to go, Harry, fuck, we, we, need, <laughs> we need these. It's very important to the script to um, film in the commission flats. So we hatched the plan and we eventually got, got them. And the people were amazing. The community was amazing. They really got behind us. They really sort of threw their arms around their little film. and helped us film there and make it. And, and yeah, and the, so our idea was to like make this little city, which were the commission flats within the city, and we've got these amazing vistas of drone shots of like from the top of the flats, in, in the commission flats right across the top of them, and the city's right in the background. And I don't think I've ever seen that mm. view before from that side of the, um, into the city from um, in Melbourne, I think it's, I, I've never seen it, and it looks amazing. You should go and see the film. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so that's quite a contrast from looking at uh, locations which um, might be generic or might have character to a very specifically Footscray kind of view. Leslie, let's talk about now critiquing cities on film um, and really looking at Melbourne as a city. Does does Melbourne have a character on the kinds of um, the kinds of films that, that that we've tended to see, and what is that character? Well, I mean, we might experience Melbourne or Sydney as really large and diverse, or even exciting in person. But the the minute you put a city on screen, it invites comparisons with the great film cities of the past. New York, Berlin, Chicago, even Las Vegas, Bal Baltimore has a really distinctive cinematic character. Um, I mean, New York is a recognised fictional space where every action matters and you can find character acting or method acting in every corner. But I don't think Melbourne has been carved out as a cinematic space yet. So each individual film has to do all of its own world building. It has to build all of its own tone and mood and atmosphere which is probably the hardest aspect of filmmaking and the hardest to convey in a script. Do you think that, that filmmakers, you know, perhaps... What, what is that about? Have, have we not sufficiently fallen in love with Melbourne that we depict it uh, in that way? That like, we, we know New York on film, we know San Francisco, Paris, etc. We know the Paris end of Melbourne, uh, as, as Pia was saying, those, those places in Melbourne that look like other places. Um, why do you think um, Melbourne hasn't become uh, recognisable in that, that mode and that tone overseas? Is it because we're just too eager to offer it as a generic backdrop? Yeah, I think that um, th there, are very, there are very few films which, which explore what's specific to Melbourne. As Pia would know, it's more about what we can make past as other cities, mm. as Boston or London and the majority of filmmakers are setting their films in the bush, even if they haven't grown up there. So if even people who have grown up in Melbourne can't envision Melbourne on film, then there, that there is not much chance of diversity getting onto film. And that's a, that's a, a big issue when we think about the kinds of um, uh, cultures and faces that, that we're seeing on film, right. um, particularly when we're, when we're offering our city and its characters in, in a different way. How but does that fall? My, 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 um, my new film, Measure for Measure, that really, really celebrates Melbourne as a whole. I, 
I mean, I've been here for 10 years and I love, I, I love Australia, I love, this, I love Melbourne as a city. I think it's beautiful, aesthetically gorgeous and there's amazing places that you can go and film. And, and I've done that with Measure for Measure, not just the commission flats, but all around the Yarra, in the, all over the city, the, the, uh, the train station in there, all around St Kilda, the, what's the fun fair they're called again? The Luna, Luna Park, all around there, all around the beach. And I, I really think that the film celebrates Melbourne aesthetically as a city. And we've tried to make, we tried to do that. Because I, I prefer making urban city films than going to the, I know what you mean, like a lot, there's so many films that are made out here in mm. Australia that are, because you've got, a, you've got a ready-made landscape, but, and everyone thinks, oh, that will sell, because everyone from across the world will love this landscape, and it is, but the bush is amazing, and the Northern Territory is fantastic, and looks gorgeous, and it's, it just comes up, it films beautifully, but I, st I, be I love making films in series, because I think cityscapes are beautiful as well. So. And Pia, you've mentioned before <laughs> that other cities <laughs> like Sydney look at Melbourne a bit jealously about what's possible to, to make here, the, the locations that are possible to find. We, we are very lucky. In, in response to that earlier discussion, first of all, population. We just don't have the, the population to support the stories and crews like they do at BBC or in, in America. And I think as, as our population grows and more people are encouraged to come into the film industry and more people at a level of power, put their hand down to reach down, to bring people up, tell us your story, I think it will become a bit more diverse. But we, we are very small considering America and, and, and the system that they have in, in, in London. Our ABC, who I have worked for off and on for 25 years, as I was just explaining, our drama department in <coughs> ABC is gone in Melbourne. Uh, we are only uh, able to shoot on location. There is no studios. Uh, Ripon Lee is, uh, sorry, uh, South Bank is great for smaller productions, but there are no drama. So, uh, Franny Fisher, I did Kath and Kim, all those jobs where there was a studio component where the writers and the, and the crew and the cast could rest are gone. So, that's something that we need to take into consideration. It's so disappointing to imagine that we should be relying on the ABC to be commissioning, commissioning those yeah. great things. Um, and um, we were having a chat earlier about, you know, the days before SVS when you actually had non-English language work on Channel 10 on a Sunday morning. There seems to be, in the era of having that second public broadcaster, there seems to be this sort of jettisoning of, of, of a focus or of a, 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 a cultural responsibility. Mm. But, um, Leslie, it, it, it can't just be up to the ABC, can it? No, I mean... Um Individual filmmakers can tell stories in Melbourne, but the effect is always going to be slightly weird if they don't adapt it to the scale of Melbourne or Sydney. Mm. So if you try to tell, a, you know, the way fairy tales all take place in the same place in our imagination, if you try to tell a timeless tale in Melbourne, it's going to feel somewhat odd. So you have to rescale it, or you need to work with the oddness somehow and incorporate it into the style of your film. I like that, working with the oddness. Uh, I reckon that's probably almost Pia's job description. <laughs> Having to kind of respond to the, 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 the great uniqueness. That is, uh, I mean, the other thing that is very unique to Australia is our light. Yes, tell us more about that because you hear about that overseas, you, you know, people say that I've, I've returned, I've come back, I can see the light. What is it about the light? It's the sharpness of mm. our light. So if you look at a film that is filmed in Europe, in, in somewhere like London, there, there is a smokiness. No train scene with a big old train with the puff of smoke looks anywhere as good as it does in London. You know, because they have that atmospheric... Haze. Haze. Whereas Australia... Smog, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Whereas, you know, Australia, we That's have... That's the unromantic term you, for it. <laughs> if we go back, David Bowie, Let's Dance, was specifically filmed in Australian bush, even though it was a, not a story that was about Australia, specifically because of the contrasts of our light, especially in bush. And that is the, the diversity of greens, of greys, of blues, of yellows, um, 
sometimes it actually brings filmmakers here because of our light. And I've just recently done a shoot where they specifically set it in Melbourne because they could take advantage of the contrasts that not only our light offered, but uh, because we we have a variety of looks as our Essendon looks very different to Altona, looks very different to Mount Eliza, looks very different to St Kilda. If you're in Sydney and you go 20 minutes outside the bay, is that same opportunity there? It's so seductive to think about, uh, you know, the vastness of Australia, but the, but the particularity of Australia as well as looking great on film like that. Um, but as, as Leslie points out, uh, we're at a time now where there are more Australians and more people around the world living in cities than, than otherwise, that we, we are seeing, I guess, more recognisable Australias from that big sense of landscape as opposed to that real kind of specificity of cities or, or suburbs. Leslie, what's, what's, um, what's easy about landscape when it comes to filmmaking? Landscape as a, as a trope, as a character? It's instantly iconic, the way that um, cities aren't. If, if cities feel too specific and yet not iconic, then they can have that sort of, that, sh that HD effect of being like a raw video feed. They lack that cinematic quality. And with landscapes, you've instantly got that. But there are very few Australian films right now that are sort of human scaled. They mostly um, they mostly look at the big country, or they look at some, you know, deliberately small and kitsch version of the suburbs. But they're not looking at the lived reality of most people, which is in cities. Paul, how does that relate to how, how, how you've chosen, I guess, well, not just... Yeah, yeah sorry, please. go on. Oh, I was going to say, not just the particular place you've chosen to make work, but the stories you've wanted to tell in Australia. I sort of agree mm. with you, but the, as I said before, like film, the, I've only made two films, so like, um, I'm, I'm completely go against that with the filmmaking that I want to make and the stuff that I want to do, because it is easier, and I, I suppose, to go up and film in the bush and... Um, and have that instant sort of landscape and stuff. But again, I, as I say, I, I love filming in this city, and I love people, and I love, I love a cr crowded scenes, and I love, like, when in porno, we, I used, I used the people of the area. I, I brought them into it. I found, I found some amazing characters that that lived there, that, that grew there, that were part of it. It seeped out of them, and and I, I used them in the film, and they become the fabric of the film, and so. Uh, the more, the more I, c I encourage, it can encourage that within filmmaking. I think the, mm. the more re I, I love reality in film, and um, so when you're in like an area like the, the, the commission flats, there's there's a lot of craziness and madness going on, but there's a lot of beauty as well. There's like there's this woman Anna who's lived there for thirty years. She's from Brazil, and you know a lot of immigrants move there. That's the first. That's the first port. Really, when they'll, they'll get into commission flats and stuff, and Anna, Anna's got lives in. Um, she runs. I had to get everything through her, right? She she runs runs this this sort of community, sort of um, there in the commission flats, and so I had to get her on side so we could film there and everything. <laughs> and it was a hard to get film um, making the film there, but we went to the top rather than going to the bottom rungs and so and, and Anna was basically the top. She lived in a penthouse apartment in the top floor of the. Um, commission flats, and she's got the best views in Melbourne. I'm telling you, she's they're amazing. But just using those type of people that uh, that are part of the fabric of that community within the film really enhances it for me, you know, and really brings it alive. And something else that you've mentioned being interested in is is the legacy that the film creates. You know, uh, Leslie was talking about recognisable cities and, and, and what we know or what we feel we know about certain uh, cities around the world and the life there and the communities just by having seen them on film. But tell us about the legacy for that really specific community that you're creating by making that film. Um. <laughs> I don't know if it will be a legacy. It's all, you know, Australian films are hard to get out there into the marketplace and get Australians to come actually and support Australian films. It's like we, we go out and we try and make them and we, you know, we, and we want people to come to the cinema, but it's hard to compete within, a, in, within the marketplace against 
you know, $200 million American Marvel films when you're making a two and a half million dollar Australian film, but we're telling Australian stories. I think I want to I want to tell Australian stories, stories that are happening to our our city and our culture, and and how we are changing as a culture and stuff, and really reflecting that in the film. So that's the main legacy I want to sort of mark that I put in the film is is about who how we are a changing culture in Australia more so than the the legacy of the the series, but. Uh, the legacy of the aesthetic of the um, buildings or places where I film. It's that thing about how, you know, just observing something or being in there actually changes it, which I think is really interesting. And I imagine, Pia, there are times where, you know, you would be conscious that the work that you're doing, the locations that you're choosing, are going to change those places and change that part of the city. That is, that is the biggest heartache of location managing. Oh, uh, tell us how. And it does bring me to tears sometimes. Oh. Uh, but the renovation of sticky carpeted pubs <laughs> when you're oh, trying to do bring period... Back the sticky carpet. ...is really difficult. Um, I think the last time I cried... Filmed in the railway hotel, that was amazing. Yeah, yeah. Oh. After I did, uh, I did a together. series called... Uh, big, um, a Chinese series, Australian Chinese series called um, Whistleblower took a lot, but I reopened a uh, Hazelwood power plant for filming. <laughs> and, and that was important because it, it, it put over $200,000 worth into a community that was dying. The power plant 100% uh, donated the location fee to the local lifeline. Amazing. It saved. That's uh, amazing. So sometimes it legacy mm. might be about story mm. but like I can tell you I did the first two series of Kath and Kim and a majority of those locations have been pulled down so yeah right a lot of my locations over the last 25 years the only legacy I can have is that they're on film and that, so does that feel you mentioned it's heartbreaking when things are then destroyed but I imagine there's also that's a deep sense of responsibility, particularly if you're going into someone's home or having to find these locations that mean a lot mm. to people. There must also be that deep sense of responsibility of how is it going to be depicted? What, what will happen? Well, interestingly enough, uh, Paul had uh, given me a phone call, as he did, to talk about Housing Commission. I had tried to get into Housing Commission before... And, and they are very sensitive as to how they're portrayed, just yeah, like of course. Parks Victoria, yeah. just yeah. like uh, National Trust. They all want to see the script to see how they're going to be portrayed. Obviously, uh, your script was accepted. It wasn't, though. It did portray them that well, though. But <laughs> I don't but it, know. <laughs> but it did, it, it, in the end, it did. And what we, 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 we had to tell them and convince them that we... We're portraying the community community as a whole in a, in a, in a good way, but there's also some bad stuff happens mm. within that, and, and it's just portraying it in reality, really. And you, you know, you've got to put what's and all, or it's not real. So, but so they accepted that. Yeah. But yeah, it uh, it just breaks my heart. Leslie, speaking of um, yeah, that kind of. That, that heartbreaking disjunction between the place and its stories or, you know, whose stories we're, we're telling. What are some of the... We were saying earlier there was a report released by Diversity Arts Australia today called Shifting the Balance, which is really well worth having a look at, uh, looking at the diversity balance in, um, in the, the arts sector as a whole and just shockingly how far we have to go to make sure that um, our performing arts spaces, our films, uh, our galleries um, are really you know, the Australia that is Australia as opposed to um, a very unrecognisably strangely white Australia. Um, looking at it, you know, from, from the eyes of a critic, um, what are the kinds of, I guess, trends that you're seeing? We've kind of... You like to think of cultural progress as being a lovely, positive linear thing that just constantly gets better but I think we've all been in conversations lately about you know a high water mark having been in the past what is going on I mean we're quite conscious of there being a lack of perhaps African Australian and um, Asian Australian representation acting mm. but I mean even the proportion of European pr representation has dropped you know significantly if you think of all those you know actresses of our childhood Gio Caridi's 
Zoe Caridi's... Um, All the Caridi's family. Right. <laughs> you know, D Dina Panozzo, Peter Tapano, yeah. where, where did they all go? Um, by, by today's standards, they would seem quite forcefully ethnic. Um, what we've got today is this um, very sort of model-esque type of um, clone that seems to be the ideal for casting agents, especially for actresses. It's pale, it's kind of like a, a mini Kate Blanchett. It's sort of translucent, ethereal, <laughs> uh, aristocratic, I think they call it, which is a way of saying, you know, patrician, which is a way of <laughs> saying not ethnic, right? Yeah. So um, yeah. that, I don't know why that's taken over. Is it casting agents? Is it directors? Uh, you know, I don't know, I don't. See, in making films these days, there's, um, can you hear me, sorry? Making films these days, um, there, there's got, there is a, such a, a big heavy push on bringing uh, all different cultures into the mix and making it that way. And they're really pushing, they're really pushing diversity hugely. And, and, and when you're, a, 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 and you're a, which is a great thing. Mm. Uh, and when, even when you're applying for funding and everything like that, you've got to put down what uh, diversity you've got within it, which is a great thing to move forward. So that it becomes much more inclusive for everyone in the filming society and for culture and everything, that we are using that percentage thing. And I mean, but it, it still comes out, I know it still comes Sorry. out as being, it looks it's white, 95% white in this country. I mean, you do show Sudanese faces and Vietnamese faces on screen, which is a good start. But what we really need is someone who's um, an actor of color who's distinctive, who the camera regards as irreplaceable, singular. Yeah, not just someone who fills in the screen. Yeah, I, I agree. But uh, how does that come around if, unless they come around? You know, I mean, you, 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 well, they. Well, uh, I'm, uh, I'm sort of asking. You know, where is our? Denzel Washington from Australia needs to come up and be that person. Well, I'm, I'm asking where, where is our Idris Elba or where is our Tandy Newton? I can't believe that the talent just isn't out there. Pia, uh, it is out there. Uh, and so, in 2010, I did an amazing series called The Slap which was quite groundbreaking at its time. I was, was in com it. Yes, you were. <laughs> you were very good, darling. You were very good. Was anyone else in the slab? Yeah, everyone was in the slab. <laughs> but it was, it was seriously about embracing different cultures and having a diversity. And again, it was ABC. So until, um, until I can see some sort of... I, I, I don't know where to... The diversity, Look, we're I, definitely I, going I, backwards. I we found it, yeah. I found that coming over here as, a, as an actor being Scottish, that I, I couldn't even, you know, I'm white, and I'm, but I'm Scottish, so people are going, oh, you can't, you, you can't be a, in Australia, you can't give them a, an Australian part. I'm like, why can't it be a Scottish doctor coming here and playing a doctor? Like, there seems to be quite a narrow band of what's plausibly Australian in terms of location as well as people on film. Yeah. yeah, I remember working at SBS um, oh, 10, 15 years ago and getting to the point where, like, having to convince my colleagues, you know, it's okay to have accents on air, right? <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> you know, I learned English at a young age um, and have worked in broadcasting, thus the rounded tone, um, but it is still, it's still a strange thing to have that expectation of hearing accents, which I just find utterly, utterly bizarre. Now, we have got some time for questions, and I realised I forgot to ask who was going to rove with the mic. It's a very important part of the conversation, is the roving with the mic. Uh, there is a rover and also a mic. So we have, the two, we have the two necessary conditions for then the questions from the audience. Please stick your hand right up so that I can see it. There is a person just here with their hand up. Excellent. Hello, thank you for doing the panel. Oh, stand up, sure, okay, hello. Um, I might ramble a bit before I get to my question. I'll cut you Very right off if you do. Thank you. Yeah, just do it. <laughs> you've, got, you've got eight minutes to ramble. Oh, geez, okay, here I go. Um, the, a film came out a couple of years ago called Upgrade um, that I thought represented Melbourne in a really beautiful way. Oh, I haven't seen it. Tell us about it. Um, it's like a sci-fi dystopian film um, with a lead American actor, and everyone else is Australian, but they're all doing American accents. Yeah. Harrison Gilbertson's in it. Yeah, I, I can't remember the yeah. actor. I can't remember the names, but um, I thought it was a very good film that would do really well with audiences. Um, 
There's a shot of Parliament House with an American flag out the front. Whoa. That <laughs> broke my heart. It's treasonous. Um, treasonous. You know, it's shot like, that's Flinders Street Station, that's the M3 freeway. It's really Melbourne. Um, and, of course, they said in America, which I understand for marketing purposes, you have to do that. Um, the film outperformed expectations in the US. Um, it did poorly here, obviously. It boxed off as better in South Korea than it did Australia. Mm. And it was filmed here with all Australian actors except for the male lead, who was American. Um, so I guess my question is, what do we have to do to show Australian audiences that they are being served with city stories? Because I think that's a big issue, a big disconnect between... Australian audiences, as you've mentioned, being fed Bush, Bush Outback films when most Australians live 20 k's from the CBD of their state. I mean, or a lot do. And they're the people who like to go see movies. So um, how do we connect those two things together? How do we show them their films are being made? Who would like to tackle that one? I can uh, see, I can so see Pia leaning into the mic. It was originally called STEM and uh, I had worked closely with the production when I was in my previous role at Film Victoria and everything was uh, Melbourne, Melbourne, Melbourne until that scene as well. And I think that we, we just really suffer from a cultural cringe that, that we just establish storylines are best for, for Bush rather than... But then you've got something like Offspring which is set in a city. That, that tells a, a, a great story about inner city. This new thing, The Life is Murder with Lucy Lawless is all about city. So I think there are things are starting to change, but I think it's for some reason a long way with film. There seems to be a difference between watching a local television series set in Melbourne. I used to work on Rush, always asked about where that was shot, where that was shot, versus film where there is perhaps a laziness... Uh, that is maybe not so much experienced at the moment on TV. And it goes I mean, back to, yeah. yeah, some of my framing comments around we, we're creating all these financial and tax incentives for other production companies to come in, but then we're complicit in the erasure of our own, you know, kind of cultural <laughs> landscape and saying, well, here you go, we'll happily take your money and maybe you'll employ some of our people as well, but then just, you know, off you go... However, however, uh, so anything that receives government funding must have at least 90% crew. The other thing to remind ourselves is when I was doing Whistleblower, I uh, had reached out to Film Victoria and created an uh, apprenticeship. We have kids coming out from all these media schools desperate to go out there and, and make films. We no longer have the apprenticeships that they used to have at Channel 7, Channel 9, Channel yeah. 2. Yeah. And these kids need to be trained up when I first started in my 20s, 20 years ago. The average age was 20. The average age now of film crew is 40 to 50. And so we've got to get that pipeline stuff we've right as well. We've got to get these young kids in. The person in the hat, if you could stand so we can see you. Yeah, um, the Windsor Hotel's under threat. And, like, it's only the last sort of 19th century hotel we've got. And, like, can you sort of talk to Heritage Victoria about saving iconic buildings for location? Uh, yes, I've filmed probably 12 times at uh, the Windsor Hotel representing both Melbourne and International over the last you know, number and number of years. That staircase is beyond magnificent and is one of two that is left in the Southern Hemisphere. We are badgering as much as we can, but we are just lowly film crew. Can I say the Windsor Hotel do very well out of me personally? Mm. <laughs> Are there a, who's got next question? There is, there you go. Uh, one of my favourite moments in film on, um, in Melbourne is David Wenham it, it stuck in the traffic behind a tram on Sydney Road. I'm sure everyone's seen that. Um, I think there are places and feelings in Melbourne that evoke those sorts of connections for us all. And I don't think you get that moment often enough and maybe it is cultural cringe, as you said, or, um, you know, just the ironing out of everything so that it's suitable for mass production. Or, I mean, I, sometimes you get the Australian accent with subtitles, for example. But people come to Australia, they don't know anything. They don't know our Aboriginal history. You have to tell them all about it. And that's the sort of thing 
that's not reaching the rest of the world. And yet there's really strong influences like, you know, those feelings we all have about Melbourne. So can you talk about that? I don't think I've really asked a question. <laughs> it's I mean, that strong it's conviction that, um, um, yes, we do have a uniqueness about our culture and we do want to see that depicted on film. And so why isn't it happening? I guess that maybe a, um, a, a way of also adding to that question might be we've mentioned some of those, you know, other iconic cities that we feel like we know so well. You know, do, do New Yorkers look at films about New York and think, oh, you know, that's my city, or they have a generic I connection. I they still do, because uh, uh, New York films amazingly, and I love looking at, you know, Manhattan and the skyline and all that stuff in New York. And, but I think people have got to, you know, it's all about money and funding and people writing their stories within the city and, and people getting behind it. And so so we can then make Melbourne as a city uh, uh, as iconic, if, you know, never be as iconic as New York. Or, but try to get it Wanted. out there wor worldwide so that people, you know, like for the Grand Prix, for example, you know, they've always got that shot worldwide over the lake and everything like that. And that goes out to everywhere across the world because uh, people will watch the Grand Prix all over the world. And I think we, the more we start filming within the series, Sydney's got it because of the harbour and the bridge and everything like that. We, And we're... Melbourne is growing. It's, it's growing massively as a city in, in like the buildings. And some of them are amazing and beautiful. And I think the more we start filming and using that, it will gradually get there, hopefully. Leslie, were you just going to jump in? Yeah. Yeah. I'll, when you were saying that there are feelings specific to Melbourne, I mean, there are. it's probably not enough to show Melbourne, right? There are series like Halifax FP that um, you know, are very ostentatious about showing trams and Melbourne landmarks, but they don't feel like Melbourne. It just feels like a BBC series that happens to be filmed in Melbourne. Um, the tone comes from Boston or from, or from London, anywhere but Melbourne. Um, so there's really just a handful of films, I think, that depict those Melbourne feelings you're talking about. Um, uh, a super low budget film made about 12 years ago, Bill Masoulis's A Nocturne might be one that you want to check out that shows the graffiti, the the goth scene, so much of the things that we don't see, the middle class Vietnamese community, everything that's invisible to to us on an um, invisible in film, but visible to us on a daily basis, is in that film. But he still had to make that under the rubric of a genre film. Um, it's ostensibly the film is about vampires, but I don't think the film is really interested in vampires. It's more interested in Collingwood from 10 p.m. to 3 a.m. That's what the film's really about. Look, some of my favourite Collingwood people are vampires, so <laughs> it's entirely valid. So just to give you a, a, an answer that to think about is it's all based on writers. So the David Wenham series that you're talking about, Behind the Tram, was based on the, the Brush Off, which was a series that was set specifically in Melbourne and was adapted by Andrew Knight. Something like I also did a series called Jack Irish, again based on a television series specifically set in Melbourne, there to capture Melbourne moments behind a tram, bike lanes and stuff. So really, I think that does it really well. We though, Jack need, it's Irish. the writers, the writers, the writers put it on paper. We will find it. We will get that. But and the cinematographers too, as yeah. right, because yep. you're talking about the distinctness of the light. Yep, absolutely. Writers and cinematographers. But now, person in the middle, yes, uh, I was just going to ask, were you just catching my eye or did you actually have a question? Oh, both, even better. Hi. So, um, culturally, economically, in, you know, in a whole bunch of metrics, Melbourne is rated like more than the equal of many of the film, many of the cities we've described tonight as being filmically iconic. Crazy Rich Asians is an example of a recent film that took a, a city that was small in film, but big in many other respects, and made that film, ma made that city iconic on film. Um, is, is that really beyond us? So the uh, uh, art director designer for Crazy Rich Asian, Asians uh, was the uh, production manager for Preacher, which is a series I've just finished filming in Melbourne. That's $60 million, literally $10 million per two episodes. And uh, it's already been announced, and we can say that within the first opening episodes, it's based in Melbourne. They land in Melbourne. So uh, we have literally, when you watch the series, uh, that every single iconic Melbourne location, anything we can stamp to make sure that people know it's not Sydney, <laughs> is in Melbourne. So, yeah, the Crazy Rich Asians, and that's from the designer 
who worked on that show, who came to Melbourne, who said, I want to do something iconic like I did over there. So again, it's up to people on that level, bringing their hand down, helping others step up. And that is, that they're saying that is Melbourne. Mm. They are, oh, that's good. They're very because it does come down to people having the budget to make a film for, but American films would be $50 million, you know, or $60 million, and that's sort of in the middle. Uh, you know, where we don't make films for that amount of money here. It's got the, the budget to really, really cover it and make it as iconic as what they did with that film. But I wish we did. That would be great. And it would really help the film industry as well. That would be quite them. extraordinary. Yeah. There was a question right up the back. Yes, excellent. Uh, so far tonight, we've been talking mainly about Melbourne, and I think we touch on Sydney as well. I just wonder whether there have been any worthwhile quote-unquote films that have been made or that will be made in the other cities of our lovely country, Look, such as Brisbane, you, Adelaide. You've made the important point that there are so other on. cities that exist in Australia. I know it is <laughs> often hard to believe. <laughs> there is somewhere outside of Melbourne and Sydney. <laughs> A very good question. Are there films that spring to mind for you that, are, that have got that, that iconic... Adelaide, Darwin, Kalgoorlie kind of feel. Newcastle gets a Newcastle. good rap, doesn't it? For yeah. the surfing and stuff like that. That's been in a few good films and um, comes films really well. Yeah, Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, uh, uh, Robert Proust, Prince, uh, Thor. So again, those the, the first couple like, like big landscape films. Yeah. But um, oh, there are some you know particularly recognisable towns in in Priscilla as well, but. Yeah, what are some... Ha have you um, worked outside of... I, I have, the two and, big and boyfriends don't like it when you say, I'll, I'll, I'll see you in nine months. <laughs> uh, so I don't do it. I have filmed um, in, in Queensland. They're certainly coming up. Uh, they just don't have the history of amazing different locations like you may find in, in Melbourne. Uh, More to Combat is at the moment filming in uh, South Australia. So they're getting quite a reputation, especially for arid, dry, interesting spaces. Mm. Their, their township is also quite quite great. Um, you know, Melbourne as a city right now, we're having a lot of pressure with all the metro trains. It's very difficult to lock down streets for a film shoot. <laughs> so you've got to try and squ squidge around it as best you can. But there are many other... Uh, Melbourne in itself, I think... Uh, is becoming more of a location to film at. For example, I had worked with uh, the producer of Mad Max. He will never go to to South. Uh, he won't go to South Africa again because the costs of hiring the security crew to be able to travel the the location crew from one lane, whereas in Melbourne we just don't have those security issues. Where but we have the arid landscape, so our distance is becoming our our greatest asset um, and the diversity of, of locations but ultimately it becomes down to where we can get the crew and the talent and for the meantime it will remain to be Melbourne and Sydney. And I imagine just trying to get crew, I mean I'm thinking of, I was at a presentation uh, last year uh, by one of our finance corporations, one of, the, one of our film finance corporations who put this great roadshow together for um, uh, the international market, but just doing this great roadshow of regional cities. Uh, and what's unique about them. So these wonderful kind of flyovers and then these great stats of we're this close to an airport, we're this close to this, we're this mm. close to that. And it's such a, you know, L Leslie, how, how much do you think that, that question of, um, you know, not just the finances but the logistics of, of what can be made, how much is that, I guess, um, <laughs> determining the character and the diversity of what is made? Well, um, I, mean, I mean, some of the most, um, the, the films which are mo focused most intensely on our cities are actually foreign films, uh, Bollywood films. I mean, if you remember yes. that 2005 film, Salam Namaste, that took bits of Great Ocean Road That's and right. um, Melbourne Central and put them all together as kind of a fantasy city, almost like the city of crazy rich Asians, foreign films seem to find Melbourne and S Sydney sufficiently mythological. They seem to find them quite convincing. <laughs> Melbourne's in a place that can drive action, even if 
you know, this, this, this Melbourne of struggling students, str struggling students with waterfront apartments doesn't really have much to do with us. Um, uh, there was a film, you know, there have be, been Iranian films, Chinese films kind of set, that, that, that they're kind of set in the mystique of Melbourne somehow. And, but we can't do it for ourselves, weirdly. There's a question also right at the back. Sorry, we're really uh, uh, making the MIF volunteers do the, the dash up and down. It's all very prices right. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, you mentioned Salam Namaste, so I thought I'd share my experience with that film. Oh, great. Um, so I was born in Kenya and migrated to Australia in 2006. And before moving here, I actually watched Salam Namaste. So I thought that I'd probably have a house somewhere you know, along the Great Ocean Road. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Overlooking the beach. Um, People would break into song. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I think um, I'm, I'm currently making a web series which is called Salma and the City. It's like a Muslim version of Sex and the City. Oh. It's not set in the CBD, it's set in Werribee. Um, <laughs> yes. Oh, we've, got, we've had a cheer for oh, Werribee like up the that. front yeah, here. Yeah, oh, excellent. Tell us more about it. Um, so, I guess... Like my audience we is you up here. part of my audience is the international community, um, and I think for me as a writer, <coughs> it was about being authentic in where the characters are placed. Um, however, there's this part of me that really like I love the city, even though my characters would not naturally be living in the city. I I'm thinking of stories where I can set um, the the main location could be the Melbourne CBD, um, but I guess the question is, what's, what's an ideal way of um, projecting or representing Melbourne to an international audience, like giving it a bit of um, a uniqueness, but also that kind of, oh yeah, I know where this is, you know, that's the Flinders Street or that's Rod Laver, things like that. Yeah, good question. Piers, hang that over to Paul. What do you reckon, Paul? I don't know if there really is like iconic, worldwide iconic landscapes from in Melbourne that we, that would be recognisable in any country. Well, in well the how world. how would you, through filmmaking, make Melbourne iconic <coughs> for an for an audience? Well, the Melbourne of Salam Namaste has already become iconic. I mean, uh, the female lead, as you would know, um, is a medical student at La Trobe University. Um, La Trobe doesn't have a medical faculty, but they received <laughs> so much demand. But they do now. <laughs> they, were, well, they received so much demand that, that, that reportedly they were thinking of setting up a medical department. <laughs> That's so, you know, film can reshape the reality of the city. Yeah. Uh, and, and my answer is, uh, that's actually in your head. You have it there, and you just need to write it down and make it iconic, or at least give us the bones and then support the people that you've employed, and we will help you make it iconic. But it's up to you to show your local areas as much as possible. It also brings to mind a great question, and then the next question will be from the person who's just put their hand up there. But that brings to mind a, a good question for the panel, which is also around distribution and um, the internet and subscription services, so Netflix and so on. A lot has changed in the way that we find out about films, that we watch films. I think one of the really great things about a film festival is that it immerses us in a world of film. We have these conversations, we can go and see you know, so many films back to back. But then we are consuming, to use that awful content word, uh, we are consuming film in so many different ways. And we talked before about uh, the ABC not having a studio, the impact on the Australian culture when the ABC makes decisions and, and uh, when certain kinds of funding aren't available, the impact from the closure of SBS Independence, you know, f for example. How much is contemporary access and distribution um, impacting on what stories are being told and what's being d depicted? Uh, to me, huge. Mm. Uh, I, I, I will openly say I, I hate, I hate working with Channel Nine and Channel Seven. Oh, uh, anyone from Channel Nine or Seven sorry. in the audience? <laughs> Tell us why, Pia. Uh, because they don't offer the diversity. They don't. Storylines are boring. Everyone's bland. Oh look, oh look, 
is at the, the Princess Bridge again. Oh, yay. <laughs> We're in St Kilda again. Oh, Fitzroy again. Mm. So, uh, and I only have ever found that sort of diversity in independent film, ABC or SBS. Mm. And I, I think that it's, that it's, uh, it's a crying shame. And what about Netflix and Stan, the kinds of things that they'll kind of corner as opposed to what we can find and make on YouTube, for example, Paul? Yeah, well, a lot of, I mean, there's, a, there's a, I know this guy, he's got a film at the Melbourne Film Festival at the moment, and he, he went out to the Ukraine to make his film beca for because he couldn't afford to make it here. Do you it's a top here? place, Ukraine. Yeah, and he, and he, he made this beautiful mm. little film called The Family, and it's it's mm. funny and it's gorgeous. And he made it for I don't know fifteen thousand dollars or something, and <laughs> and brought it back here, and it's in the film festival. And Miff um, got behind it and helped him finish it by finishing funds. And th so the landscape's changing massively because people can go out and make the f their own films now and put it on YouTube and. and and web web series and stuff like that. So, um, I don't know. It's like, it's, it all gets down, at the end of the day, it all gets down to finance. Um, getting money, getting people behind you. And that's it. And you can have the best vision, the best storylines, everything, but you've just got to get people behind you willing to invest money into, mm -hmm. your, into <laughs> your vision and your story and, and help you make it. And, and that's how it happens. This will be the last question, I'm afraid. Hello. Okay. Um, about a month. A little closer. Uh, about a month ago, um, I was in uh, a town south of Hobart, and at that time there was a. Uh, I d it's a sleepy, tiny little town. When I arrived, it had um, huge film trucks, and it had the whole street was just taken up with things. And I think they're filming. Kettering, um, Kettering incident or something oh, like gloaming. that. The gloaming. The gloaming. Oh, the gloaming. It's That's American right. yes. co-pro thing. It's like a, they're spending about twenty-five million on it. My right. friend's producing it. And, um, okay. Go on. Ah. Uh, yes. And <laughs> anyway, I'm, I'm assuming it's going to be um, Tasmanian Gothic or something like yeah. that because if we're talking about places with different kinds of uh, themes that attach to them. Um, that landscape, I know the Kettering incident made it look very dark, gloomy, um, threatening, you know, all the rest of it. So I'm assuming Tasmania is a chosen place for... Uh, <laughs> the, <gothic>. darkness. <laughs> the darkness. The darkness. <laughs> is Tasmania Sorry. dark? Uh, it is, but also they do mm. Rosehaven. <laughs> there you go. And also they did the film The Nightingale as well, recently as well. Tasmania, it's a, just, it's a stunning landscape yeah. and it's really close. And so, m so more and more filmmakers and companies are are yeah. going to cross there to use it because it's very accessible and, and the, the, uh, there's a, the crew is building up over there and it's yeah. easy to get crew over there. And, uh, the people doing the gloaming, they were there, they're, they've been there for six months. Uh, and, and it's been horrible being their Facebook friend because <laughs> <No>. <laughs> every single photo that they put on saying set life, <laughs> you're just going, oh, God, it's <laughs> stunning. <laughs> This has been such a great discussion. I know we could keep chatting, but unfortunately, in fact, we can't. Uh, and so I have a number of thank yous, but before um, those thank yous, this has been part of the uh, Melbourne Conversation series. So thank you to Melbourne Conversations and to the University of Melbourne Faculty of Fine Arts and Music. The next Melbourne Conversations event will be on Tuesday the 17th of September at Abbotsford Convent. Local artist Lisa Shelton will open her exhibition Addenda archiving the ephemeral, uh, where she will be burning her 40-year archive. There'll be a panel of librarians, digital archivists and artists to discuss the importance of the archives we have inherited and those we leave behind. I could feel the whole discomfort on the panel <laughs> at that very idea of burning the archive. Oh, my goodness. And good news for you, um, audience members, uh, you will all... Uh, Melbourne Conversation will, will let you know first, so you will get... Um, uh, and an email uh, uh, with a link in it to book your free tickets. So thank you very much to MIF, the Melbourne International Film Festival, which is obviously on right now, and there's like super lots to see. Hopefully you've all got one of these or the smaller phone-sized digital version, which is um, uh, obviously a lot easier to flip through. Thank you to the Wheeler Centre. 
thank you very, very much um, to the, all of the team here. Happy birthday to Kate. Uh, and George's. is it George's birthday too? Yeah, it's coincidence. Oh, I thought it was... Oh, it's, it's both of your birthdays? No. Oh, my God. It is... <laughs> It's remarkable. Happy birthday to Kate and to Georgia, who have organised this evening. They should get a whole round of applause themselves. How fabulous. And please join me in thanking Pia Emery, Paul Island and Leslie Chow. And see you all for the next Melbourne Conversations. Have a great night.